Coming to the general functional group update. Uh, my name is Sid and I'm gonna try to share my screen. I'm uh, someplace else today than my office. So forgive me if there's any technical difficulties. Um, I wanna clarify one thing. Sometimes I talk about our top priorities and dot com availability and the number of leads we uh, generate and i stress that it's those are like the two top things in the company that have to improve that i'm focused on and some people took that as meaning the people that are working on that are doing a bad job that is not the case it means that improvements in those things have the biggest impact on our growth like in a fastly growing company you continually have things like that that are kind of the, the the throttle on on the rest of the company like we could grow faster if and whatever is after that if if we have more leads if talkcom is more available that will be a thing i focus on that will be a thing i i call out um and that uh, is going to be something that that we have to improve so those are the areas where we can have the biggest impact it doesn't necessarily mean that the quality there is bad or that the people are not doing a good job or there's no good plan in place. It's only late. You might have great people working with a great plan and still it's a trouble on our growth and still it will get uh, called out. Um, number two, a, a decision we made at the executive offsite is that we'll uh, stop the early adopter program for ultimate as soon as possible as soon as possible and we'll make guest users free in uh, the ultimate edition by making guest users free uh, we take away one of the um the the the, uh, the things that our customers said is that they don't want to pay for someone that's only just commenting on things um i can't see my chat at the same time so i want to ask if there's any questions at this point i don't see anything yet feel free to speak up um another thing i wanted to uh to highlight because it's it's obvious to me but uh, i learned to i'm trying to repeat things that that are obvious to me but not, might not be for everyone else is that we're very well positioned to win in this market. We're the only ones kind of crazy enough maybe to make a single product for the whole DevOps life cycle. And that's, um, that's very, very ambitious. Uh, ambitious. I don't think any other uh, companies even, even dare to do that. And the only reason we're able to do it is because there's a lot of open source software out there so instead of us trying to make everything we're leveraging open source we're leveraging prometheus and and technologies like jaeger and Elasticsearch and all the other great things and kubernetes um, to build something and it's kind of turning the disadvantage in this market on its head when we started gitlab uh, lots of investors said yeah devops tooling yeah it's a really bad market because everything is open source we're turning that on its head it's a really great market because everything is open source so we can just take all the components leverage that open source and then the problem is integrating all of that open source hey, you you need at least 10 different components for a devops life cycle if you're not using gitlab and that that means 24 different integrations with GitLab, we, we do those integrations. We don't make the components as much as, as we focus on making them well integrated with our UX team, with a single database. And that's, that's unique. No one else is doing it. And it's an amazing value for customers because every customer you talk to is like, yeah, maintaining our tool chain, it's really hard. And everyone in the company has it organized differently and it's hurting us. A fourth thing, um, was talking to a, a potential customer yesterday and um, look they're not buying GitLab they don't want to they don't want another tool 
they don't want they don't want LDAP sync or things like that. They want our what we sell has to do a job and it has to get them to a 200% faster DevOps cycle. And we say, if you buy GitLab, your DevOps cycle is three times as fast. That's what they're buying. And uh, we should uh, even, I made a proposal today. And if you look at our uh, uh, Slack channels, I, I won't name it, but there's a Slack channel that, uh, um, we can maybe even change our pricing so that we get paid when their DevOps cycle gets faster. And I think that's an amazing opportunity because I think if we go into a company and we look at like the DevOps cycle of the different projects, I'm sure that the more of GitLab you adopt, the faster DevOps cycle can be with the integrated security testing, with the review apps, et cetera. So if we can show that there's a correlation there, we can help the customer improve their DevOps cycle just by making having more teams adopt all of GitLab. And we can maybe in the future, we get even paid by that. We get paid if we make it faster, not so much for you know, seats or for, for licenses, but just helping with the business outcome. The fifth thing is about multi-threading. Um, there was a, a thread on Hacker News about uh, Gitty and it's, uh, it's an alternative to GitLab that's written in Go. It's, it's amazingly uh, fast, it's multi-threaded, and it doesn't, it doesn't use a lot of memory. And GitLab does. And uh, right now it's using four gigabytes. Some people even say GitLab's using eight gigabytes. A lot of that is from our application server that has multiple processes. Now that that's no longer the, the latest in, in, in Ruby on Rails land, like Puma and, and Multi-threading was in, introduced years ago. We tried it, it didn't work at that time, but I think we should uh, have another stab at it and try to make GitLab multi-threaded. The first thing to implement would be the Ro Robocop rules um, for um, preventing common mistakes that, that uh, can cause problems in multi-threaded apps like global variables. And I think we should work towards work towards that. I don't think we'll get GitLab down to half a gigabyte, but a lot of people have instances on, on sites like DigitalOcean and most cloud providers, they charge for memory. So the more memory we use, the more expensive it will be to run GitLab. The last thing I'd love to talk about more is um, going beyond SaaS apps. Right now with GitLab, you kind of, we assume you develop a SaaS app. But there's some great, great uh, sites out there like BodyBuild and, and uh, lots of others that make it easier to develop for mobile. Visual Studio, for example, is also having some great features for that. There's people working on data and they have different requirements. They have something similar to a DevOps lifecycle, but then for data engineering. And then there's machine learning, uh, Jupyter, uh, not Jupyter, uh, TensorFlow and technologies like that. And there's a life cycle to, to that too. Uh, yesterday, uh, we talked to someone from Google who was uh, working on Kubeflow. And Kubeflow is uh, making it easier to kind of do machine learning in a, uh, do the machine learning life cycle. And I think it's really important that we make GitLab work not just for run of the mill Ruby and Rails applications, but also for these scenarios. One of the projects we have is BizOps. It's for data engineering, uh, making it easier to, um, to ingest data and to clean it up and to analyze it. The other big thing is what Dimitri uh, is working on, uh, our co-founder CTO. He's working on making it very easy to deploy Jupyter Hub from GitLab to make sure that when you deploy Jupyter Lab, it ties back to GitLab. And Jupyter comes up not just in data, but also in machine learning. It's becoming the lingua franca of, um, of how to do analysis. And if you don't know Jupyter, it's based on IPython notebooks. It's similar to Mathematica or Maple. And if you don't know any of those, um, it's kind of an, inter, an interactive Word document. So you have a, a document, you make a calculation, you press enter and it, it gets executed. 
Brandon, here's to the crazy ones. Yeah, that might be an Apple commercial. So thanks for that. Um, Michael asks, is there any place in the handbook that goes over the other open source tools that GitLab is leveraging within GitLab? I don't think there is. Um, but if you're interested in the BizOps section of our handbook, uh, there is, the, it's front and center what other technologies we're leveraging. And I'm sharing my screen so I can even show you uh, quickly. So uh, BizOps is leveraging Singer, DBT, Postgres, GitLab CI, and more DBT, Jupyter Hub, and possibly D3 or Superset. Um, that Slack channel, yeah, I, I guess that it's, uh, people could see my tab anyway. Uh, our normal pricing is charging $99 per user per month. Now you can't go out and do this tomorrow because I'm still arguing, not arguing, having a constructive conversation with Chad in the Slack channel. You could imagine a pricing channel where we say, oh, it's half the price. And for every percentage points, we make your DevOps life cycle faster, we charge a quarter. And if we improve it 200%, you end up being, paying the same. If we make it even faster, we get more money. James says it may, might start up slower. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of that, that might be, I don't think people care too much about our startup time. Um, what happened when we tried Puma before is that we just had a lot of code that wasn't multi-threaded in libraries, in our own code everywhere. And we just got um, horrible errors the whole time. And that was, but that was around GitLab like 4.0, 5.0. So long, long time ago. So I think we should revisit that. Yeah, I was just saying it might be that uh, turning on multi-threading makes it uh, the memory consumption worse to start with. And I think it was something to do with because each process accessing the memory, um, it, but I think there are workarounds. So it, yeah, setting the vision, we can, I think we can get there. Yep. Yeah, we also got probably some horrible memory leaks. So that might even lead to everything getting worse. Uh, but I think we have to bite through it. Patrick asks, is it possible there are, that the requirements are too different for SMB and enterprise? Um, might be possible, but I think, I think we can just go down a lot more. And, and there's always gonna be some people that wanna run it on 100 megabytes. Well, they should probably download, they should use Git web, the thing we're all based on, it comes with Git. And you can run uh, a small web server to, to, to look at your Git repos. Um, but the, the further we can lower the requirements, the entry requirements, the less space there is below us for a competitive solution to develop. And there's this theory, um, it's called the innovator's dilemma. And it kind of says most of the times you get displaced not by someone that makes something that's better. You get displaced by someone that makes something that's worse, but more affordable or lower requirements. So we're, we're not gonna lose to GitHub and Atlassian. We, we, we have a better product, we have better pricing. It does, it's, we're gonna win. However, very far in the future, 2030, we're gonna get this place for, from something that looked like a toy that was doing a worse job, but it was more affordable. And right now that thing is looking uh, like it's those, uh, those things in that Harker, Harker News article. So we should make sure that there's, as little space below us as we can. So yeah, we, we can make everyone happy, but we can probably reduce our memory requirements from four to eight gigabytes to one or two. So we, we should, and we should do that. Yep, Chad says, yeah, faster DevOps cycle makes a lot of sense. It's not on our homepage. Yeah, I agree. Um, so maybe it's on our homepage, instead of saying concurrent DevOps, which nobody knows yet, we should call out a 200% a faster DevOps cycle. 
and that would link you to a page like, hey, we can make it faster. How do we do that? We do that with concurrent DevOps. Um, so if a CIS is on the call, CIS might be an experiment worthy to run and Cortland Plus wants that. Andrew, you want to talk about Gitterly and removing the rugged code? Sure. I just it was um, on your point of of going to multi-threaded um, Ruby, and so this is like a really wasteful thing um, that is the way it is at the moment because obviously we've been trying to build Gitterly and keep the application going, and so we've got a lot of struts that we've put. You know, imagine we're building a bridge over a highway; we didn't want to stop the highway. One of those struts is that we vendor code from, from the main application into Gitterly Ruby. And so when the GitLab application runs, we have the same code running in two places. And only once we get to Gitterly v1.1 will we be able to remove that strut. Um, and at the moment, obviously, the Gitterly team are, many of them are working on other things. So this has been deprioritized and would be a big win for memory consumption. I just wanted to make that point. Cool. Yeah, I think everyone's looking forward to Gitly 1.0, where we can turn off NFS, and then Gitly 1.1, where we can get rid of the, the rugged code in memory. So, but thanks for calling that out. I forgot that. I forgot to uh, mention that on Hacker News on Sunday. Thanks, Jace, for the, for the Jupyter Hub uh, link. And uh, uh, yeah, if you haven't watched the video about Jupyter or something like that, already and you don't understand what it is, I encourage you to, to look at it. It is, it is the way that data science and machine learning is being done. Ralph plus one's chance point about calling out our the benefit to the customer instead of concurrent DevOps. William is in the call. William, feel free to speak up. John may ask about conversational development. So John, um, we're re uh, remaining, uh, renaming conversational de uh, development to their DevOps score. And the DevOps score is gonna be based on how much of GitLab you've adopted. So are you just using the version control or also the CI? Are you doing CD? Are you using the, the monitoring, et cetera? The more you use, the higher your DevOps score. And what we want for every customer is a graph. On one axis is the DevOps score of the different projects in their company. The other axis is their cycle time. And now what we hope is that there will be a line like this, and I'm probably drawing the graph, a mirror image or something, but the more of GitLab you adopt, on gen in general, the lower your uh, cycle time. That's what we're hoping for. And we're gonna build that into the product. So not only we can see it, but all the users are using that instance on GitLab 11, all those statistics should move out of the admin area and into an area where all the users can see it. And then we can have a conversation around that. Like, hey, you're seeing this trend, so would you like a 200% uh, faster DevOps cycle? Yes, okay, well, the, the way to get there is it's obvious. You can see it here, adopt more of GitLab. So how can we help your teams adopt more of GitLab? Connor asks, ending the early adopter program. I think, um, so Ashish is coordinating this. I think we'll have a cutoff date for like, this is the last date. If you're not in touch with us before this date, you cannot uh, take advantage of the early adopter program, say end of next week, but Ashish is on it. So I'm not sure what the date will be, but he'll determine that. And then you have to actually order from us, for example, end of this quarter. I'm copying Chad's comments. Cool. I don't see anything else actionable. And I'm gonna I gotta be on my way 